Hello and welcome back to RPG Research. I'm your host, uh, Hawk Robinson, uh, founder of, of the nonprofit 501c3 RPG Research. Uh, we are a nonprofit charitable organization studying the effects of all role playing game formats and their potential to help improve lives. Um, quickly introduce yourselves. John Wilker, Vice President of RPG Research. I'm Riley, Fire Tech Specialist. And we still have a remotely with us uh, Danielle. Trainee. Uh, yeah. Yep. And Mark. Thank you. And Shay. Oh. Oh. Careful. On the forehead. Uh, Shane Dean or Game Master Trainee. Welcome, welcome. So we are now, so we just finished our administrative meeting. We're now switching into our theory discussion. We alternate each Monday and each Thursday between theory and applied gaming today as one of our theory days. So I've been kind of throwing out a little bit of things that kind of start going into our theory discussions. Um, and so one of them was, this is a very foundational thing, is just some of our terminology. And we've undergone a little bit of change in the last six months as I've been trying to refine it to be accurate. I've been working on a model, an RPG model, that's so complicated because RPGs are so much. And one of the challenges, of course, everybody's run into this. Every every everybody who tries to do RPG studies in theory runs into this problem. What is a role playing game? What are the exact elements that make a role playing game a role playing game? Where is the threshold? Because it's it is, especially with the introduction of, of computer games and LARP and solo adventure books, it's become a continuum. It isn't really you know when D and D first came out. We'll forget about the Blackmore argument and such. When D and D first came out, nineteen seventy four, that was the first. Role published role playing game that set the standard of what a role playing game was. But it is what a role playing game is has undergone a lot of permutations over the intervening decades. And so every time I write a paper and do a research study on role playing gaming, I, I have to explain to people who aren't gamers, you know, psychologists, neuroscientists, recreation therapists, etc., what is a role-playing game, and try to make it as concise as possible. And again, I'm not good at being concise, I'm good at being accurate. <laughs> and this has presented a real challenge, because if you go post on any forum and ask what, it, what defines a role-playing game from other uh, recreational activities, you will get a very broad range of what's included and not included. And I'm struggling with that myself. Um, we've got a few things that we go, okay, you define a character that's separate from yourself. It has attributes that somehow help define that. Um, I argue that there needs to be some form of character growth, whether it's statistical or storyline or whatever. Your character grows, changes, and develops in some way. Others don't agree that that's a necessary requirement. So if you look at like JRPGs, Japanese role-playing games, you get loot and you might get some stat enhancements, but the characters don't necessarily grow in a lot of JRPGs unless it's the fancier ones. Um, uh, Zelda or something like that. So computers especially have blurred the definition of a role-playing game. Because originally a role-playing game was only D&D-type tabletop games. It was only tabletop role-playing games as a role-playing game. Computers, live action, and solo adventure books have all kind of blurred the line. And gone, and, that's, and so one of the first things I, that's starting to help solve this problem is I created a fifth category of hybrid RPGs. So HRPG, where it has a lot of the elements of an RPG, but it isn't quite the purest RPG. So, if we go back to the original model of what a role-playing game is, we look at D&D and derivations of that that are kind of close to the core of it, that that would be our beginning model of a role-playing game, because that's where that term was defined. Then we start getting into the live-action model, and then we start getting the computer base and the solo adventure, and that's where the mo where it starts to broaden the definition. Uh, for example, solo adventure book and module. Choose your own adventure book. The, less, the, 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 the more basic ones don't really have any growth. You don't have any character stats. You have a character that's defined in narrative. It says, you are such and such, and your friend just died yesterday, and blah, 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 and you're stuck in, you're looking for the lost city of Atlantis, and what have you. And your choices have consequences, but your character doesn't really change and grow from the consequences, and then if your character dies, you just jump back and start over, or you cheat and just go back one jump or something. <laughs> but, um, that's a pure choose-your-adventure, solo-adventure book, not a solo adventure module. Solo adventure module has 
dice rolling, character stats, maps, a lot of other, the closer to the role-playing game experience than just branching storyline. But some of the better written solo adventure books actually have some growth and definition. It says, your character is good at this, your character is strong, your character is intelligent, but not very charismatic. And they may or may not give hard numbers, but they kind of define it on a relative scale. And as you make choices, they make the choices be different because of your earlier choices. Because you made this choice and that person died, you're now afraid to choose anything except these two choices. You won't make this third choice. It's not even an option. You know, it, it'll be in the dialogue and in the internal narration that says, because of what you learned from the last thing, you won't make that choice. You will only make these two choices. Which do you choose? So there's kind of an emulated, simulated growth of a character there, which gets closer to where I talk about role-playing gaming and that kind of growth. Um, so I still haven't nailed down all of that, and nobody has, that I can find in the literature. Everybody's making stabs at it. There is not yet a, even Wikipedia and earning, there is no set definition of a role-playing game. I'm trying really hard to nail that down. I need to for these books coming out. And what I want to do is look for the common parameters across all platform, all formats. So these are the, the five formats. So, <clears throat> so the five formats, we're trying to learn them alphabetically so that we can get better at them. Electronic role-playing game. It used to be CRPGs, we're doing ERPGs, because there's audio book role-playing games and eight-track choose-your-own-adventure role-playing games, and they're, they're all electronic, but they're not really computer-based. And that really tripped me up. Like, I kind of analog versus digital. Like, yeah, analog versus digital. So in the model, I've, I've been, if I put everything under electronic and then break it out into digital versus analog and then break it out, that makes a much more logical thing versus creating too many categories at the top of the tree. Because the top of the tree is RPG. Then we branch into five. So ERPG, electronic role-playing games. Uh, then going uh, alphabetically, we have hybrid role-playing games. That's kind of the catch-all for everything else if it doesn't fit under the other four categories. Then we have live-action role-playing <coughs> games, so LARP. So ERPG, HRPG, LARP. Um, then we have solo adventure books and modules, SABM. Now that's a term I've made up. There is no industry standard for SABM. Everybody usually says choose your own adventures or interactive fiction or like they've got all these different terms, but there is no standard term for that type of media, that format. So we, we wrangled with it over a year ago and settled on Part SABM. Is, this is a choose your own adventure book. This is not because the, this is a trademark. Yeah, choose your own adventure is a trademarked product like Xerox versus mimeograph. We want to describe the activity and the product without describing a specific brand. When we say role-playing game, we're not describing D&D. D&D is a role-playing game, right. but it is not a trademark term. When we say TRPG, tabletop role-playing game, we're describing that specific type. So same thing, SABM, for now, that is stuck. I haven't, we haven't come up with a better term in over a year. I'm not sure that we think need to. Well, I, I've, I've always, I try to always be open and not get into rigid thought patterns and be open to better suggestions. But so far that's been our best one. So SABM. And then the last one, ironically, is the first, TRPG. Tabletop role-playing game. Right? That's the very first role-playing game. It's at the end of the list because alphabetically. So ERPG, HRPG, LARP, SABM, TRPG. Those are the five major branches of role-playing games. Um, we study both on the RPG research side and we implement on the RPG Therapeutics LLC side, four sectors in this industry. We look at recreation, which is how you just use it when you play with friends at home. Clarification. Yes. The four sectors do not include creation. Yeah, we're not we're not focusing. Well, I mean, we yeah we, yeah we, the, yeah we're talking about applied delivery of it of the we're not we're not talking about the publishing industry and all of that. Uh, we, there's plenty of other people doing that, Gamma and the others. Yeah. Um, so, so, but we look at the recreational use of role-playing game, and on the RPG research side, we just look at how it's used recreationally. On the RPG Therapeutics LLC side, we look at how that can be done professionally, where you're a paid game master to run a recreational game at a house, at a party, at, you know, whatever, for a non-medical or educational thing. You're just running a role-playing game as a paid GM, or you're just running it with your friends. That's the recreational sector of role-playing game implementation, whether it's tabletop, live action, what have you. Then we have um, 
Okay, actually, I have to back up because I didn't do it alphabetically. Right. I'm sorry. So yeah. alphabetically, <laughs> it should be uh, education. We're, we're, see, we're, we're working this out, right? I'm, I, I'm trying to make it more organized so it's easier for everybody to remember it. So. Um, so educational is where you're using it to teach specific knowledge or skills or you're using it in an educational setting. That covers either one. It might be you're just running it recreationally in a way, but you have to do it in a school setting. Then you have to take into account educational stuff. Or you're running it wherever, but you're specifically targeting learn skills that don't have to do with mental health, but have to do with learning skills, uh, learning knowledge, things like that. How to learn to learn. <coughs> learning to do the bus system. Yeah, it's some right. So those those are uh, the, the educational sector. Then we have the entertainment sector, which is. Uh, you are doing it for an audience, whether it's an audience, you're on stage, you're doing it for the, the audience there physically, or you're doing it online. You're doing it to entertain an audience. Now, you guys might be having fun running your game, but the goal of the game is to entertain your audience, not yourselves, which is different than recreation, which we'll get to. So that's entertainment. So that's when I'm torn here. So before I did it, I started, I went recreation, then entertainment, then education, then therapeutic, because that was levels of complexity. Uh, right. I'm thinking that was better, wasn't it? All right. I think levels of complexity. Formats works alphabetically, but sectors, we should just go with level of complexity. Yeah, I agree. Okay. So we're going back to that. So recreation, because that's the format most people know it in. The, um, then entertainment, where it's a layer uh, on top of recreation, but you're doing it to entertain the audience. Then education, because that adds more complexity because you're trying to teach subjects. Then finally, therapeutic, where you're trying to achieve specific measurable therapeutic goals. They may be physical therapy related. They may be mental health, they may be social skills, whatever. Anything to do with that, the term therapy would come in appropriately is therapy. And that's the most complicated. So, okay, so we'll do it that way from simplest to most complicated because that adds those layers to it. So that's the five formats and the four sectors. What are some other lists that I bring up all the time along those lines just so that our new guys are up on the terminology? Danielle, you have anything? Did we lose? No, she's there. Okay. Oh, uh, not that I can. Can you okay. go through for a second? Genres. Genres. So we, yeah, but genres is a very long list. So on the website, I have a, I think I have it on the website. I've been working on this lengthy genres course, list. The archetypes. Oh, I'm not, I'm not on that. Archetypes. Archetypes. Yeah, archetype. Well, we're still, we're yeah, working on that book. <laughs> so we're, we're not going to hit you. I mean, we, we went over. Was it? GMs. When did we do GM archetypes? That was, that was just that was Saturday, Thursday. Mm -hmm. Thursday? Yeah. So we, yeah, we went over player and GM archetypes just this last Thursday. Um, and Mark, uh, a if you're a Patreon supporter, you can get access to the videos. But B, as a volunteer, we'll start getting you links so you can catch up on any of the past videos. But we have a YouTube channel, youtubecom forward research where you can catch up on a lot of previous sessions. There's Bartlett's. Oh, Bartles, not Bartlett, Bartles. I'm always in Bartlett. Okay, Bartles Taxonomy of Player Type. You'll hear me reference player type a lot, which is related to archetypes. Um, oh, oh, stereotype versus archetype. That's right. an important term. So we differentiate between stereotype and archetype. Stereotype is a constraining box that you put people into. All of that population is like this. And you're put into that, regardless of whatever reality is, a stereotype constrains you. An archetype is a starting point, place where it says this list of traits is very common with this group or this person. We see these five traits in this archetype, and this person's showing those five traits. So it's similar to like a diagnosis in the DSM, where you check off a list, and if you get more than seven out of nine, you say, you know, bipolar type two disorder or something like that. And it's just a shorthand. It's not it's not constraining, but it's a shorthand to say, oh, if I say a rules lawyer, you go, ah, I have a pretty good idea what a rules lawyer is. Uh, they, you know, that they argue about rules, they can disrupt the game, um, they have a lot of anxiety about de deviation from the rules. These are, these are things, when I say rules lawyer, those things come to mind. Um, I don't have to say every time all those traits to define a person with those traits. I can say, oh, he was a real rules lawyer. You know what I'm talking about. That's an archetype. Now, is he only a rules lawyer? No. I'm not saying, you know, all 
He's Joe Schmoes are rules lawyers, Murderbobos. right? I mean, that's a stereotype, whatever, yeah. I'm saying, well, he has these traits, and this person is very much a, a, a rules lawyer. It's a starting point for being able to quickly move on to, okay, he's a rules lawyer. We need to address that. Is he disruptive or not? Yes, he's disruptive. He stops the game from proceeding because he has to argue every, every little rule. All right, well, we have techniques for addressing their anxiety because when they're disruptive type rules lawyer, they're, they're rules lawyers that it's not that big a deal. They just like to be precise, and that's okay. It's when they disrupt the game and the flow that you've got to address it. You need to de-escalate them. And my experience has been the majority of rules lawyers come from a place of high anxiety. Um, their lives, external to the game, may or may not be chaotic. They may or may not be that they feel they have no control. They may be that they, they have very calm, safe lives in the real world, and they're kind of bored with it. And they come to gaming because it lets them experience it. And they also experience in the real world that there aren't real heroes and that there isn't a whole lot. The rules are fuzzy and unclear, and, and they're pretty unhappy with their lives. And they don't feel like, the main thing is they feel out of control in the world or in their own lives. They feel in control of their lives. They're not in control of the world, whatever. They come to the game because it gives them, for these particular archetypes, it gives them a semblance of control and predictability in an otherwise unpredictable world. And it helps them feel safe to do and have opportunities to do things they would never do in the real world. It gives them chances to be heroes and such. Or it gives them chances <coughs> to be villains, whatever. Um, and it's in a way that they understand because it's clearly defined rules, clearly defined parameters. You start mucking with those, anxiety, big knot in the gut and that they're going to react accordingly in an emotional state and they're going to fixate on what's causing the upset even if they don't realize most of them are not aware of their level of anxiety unless i work with them for a while uh, it takes several sessions before they start to recognize they're having anxiety when i muck with the rules because i'll be totally blase about a rule if it if it makes the game better play better um and I've really set off some rules lawyers doing that. However, to address that, one of the things I do is if I create a new rule, I try to be consistent about it. So this is house rules and such. We're like, okay, in this campaign, we've decided that magic can only be detected under these circumstances. It doesn't say that in the rule book. We're saying that in this particular setting. As long as I'm consistent about that, that will help assuage some of the concern. But you have to get to that point where they trust you enough that you'll be consistent. And that can take a little while. One of the things you can do with a rules lawyer is turn them into your, your helper. Um, if you can get them to stop stopping the game, right? Quit arguing right then. You say, oh, that's great. Write that. I want you to help me because I want to be consistent with these things too. And you know how games change. We're going to have to rule on stuff. So would you please, um, you know, I'll give you some scratch paper or a notebook. Write down when stuff comes up. And as long as it's not critical, like your character's going to die, just write it down and we'll talk about it during the break or the end of the session. If it's more critical, pass me a post-it. Say, hey, I, we need to talk about this. Don't interrupt the game, you know, uh, to, to do it. And usually I, after a couple of sessions, I can get them to do that. And once they learn that I do indeed follow through and talk to them and let them have their say and that there's a give and take. They're like, okay, you know, that's a good point. You know, going forward, let's go back. Let's let's rein that in. You're right. I didn't realize, you know, we can't roll back the story, but let's let's fix the rule that we're not going to do that again. Or, okay, going forward, this is how it is. If it's going to change, we'll talk about it before we make a big change. Because if we find out it's not working, you, go, you know, I think that's kind of OP. We might need to tweak that back a little. When that happens, and you say, I want you to help me with rules, you just, the other thing, like, hey, can you look up uh, that section on that particular rule for me? I'm kind of fuzzy on it. They love. That makes them feel useful and part of it. And you're assuaging their concern about out of control because it starts to bring order back. And they feel useful, and it doesn't become combative. It becomes back to cooperative, which is what you want. That's just one example of one archetype. It's one of the easier ones to illustrate. Some of those are more challenging. That one's actually pretty easy. But a lot of them do not realize it comes from anxiety until I've worked with them, and then I start having them start doing a little mindfulness awareness of where their body is at and their gut is at. And I'm like, dude, you're like clenching your teeth that whole time. I'm like, I am? They have no awareness. Mm -hmm. No awareness. Um, and it doesn't have to be therapy to help people through this to, to have more people be able to enjoy the game. If you don't address archetypes that are disruptive, they tend to either escalate or just quit. And they can destroy groups if they escalate.
they can drive other people away and can kill a whole group. I've seen it time and time and time again. So the moment you recognize that you have a disruptive archetype, you want to nip it in the bud as quickly as possible. Because often it takes time, so you need to first become aware of it. And that's where we have you know that training being so important. And that's why we're trying to define these things. So we have the, you know, we've got a whole bunch of them. We're up around 20 or so archetypes. We're still nailing down the exact criteria. And it's the same with RPG. We're still trying to nail this down um, so that we have consistent terminology between each other. So then we can come up with consistent methodology and consistent assessments. And then we can uh, 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 determine their validity and reliability when used in research and then when used in professional settings as well. You look like you want to say something. Nope. No, I'm just okay. paying attention. Okay. Um... So that's stereotype versus archetype. Gives you a good idea of what I mean by an archetype. You can have multiple archetypes in the same person. Mm-hmm. You know, they can, they can have some aspects of others. You have people who don't fit any one archetype. They just have traits from all over. That's great. A well-rounded game or whatever. Uh, that is, archetype is not automatically the same as play style. Mm-hmm. Because archetype, usually in the context we're using it, we're talking about to the level of disruption. Doesn't mm-hmm. have to be disruptive. But it, for them, it does become a little bit of a constraint if they get very narrow in their archetype. If they do become the cliche rules lawyer, and that's all they are, um, and that's why you want to make sure you don't put in the stereotype of a rules lawyer, that's, that, 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 that is all they are. You want to look at it as archetype, not stereotype. But then there's just play style. And so there's Bartle's taxonomy of play style. And I need to switch networks here because the Wi Fi doesn't out. reach into here. Um, and so Bartle's taxonomy of player style was actually made for video games back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and was attempting to try to figure out why people are motivated to play certain types of video games. Um, it didn't have to be limited to role-playing games. It could be any type of game, but, but this is especially useful for play, for role-playing games. And it applies to all of the formats. So now when I say format, you know what I'm talking about, right? What are the, what are the five formats, Shane? Um, electronic hybrid LARPs. Solo and TTRPG. Uh, just TRPG. One T. We don't need two T's. Because C- tabletop's one word. <laughs> I mean, it is kind of weird. Just break it up with two words. Well, <laughs> we're trying to keep it at four letters because you get longer acronyms. So um, there's enough acronyms in the world as it is. <laughs> yes. I come from tech writer. where there's a gazillion of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and medical. Oh, my goodness. And, and the problem with medical acronyms is each practice, like between PT and OT and RT and ST and all those, even that, right, those are acronyms. Between physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, uh, recreation therapy, well, RT could also be respiratory therapy. Right. Oh, you know, all of them, <laughs> context, context, context. Uh, the abbreviations used for TX, um, <coughs> you know, for therapy versus Rx, you know, a Px or a Dx for diagnostic in other medical, sl- it has a different meaning. Um, so we have to be careful about that. And and, um, and we're at the forefront, I think, um, and from talking to these people at PAX and elsewhere, we're kind of at the forefront of s- establishing these things. So we want to be mindful and considerate of that and try to build some consistency because it'll make it a lot easier to have conversations without getting confused. So... Is it connected yet? Good. So um, we've got it on our site as well, but I'm pretty sure if you just do a web search on Bartle's taxonomy or Bartle talks at taxonomy, I think we'll pull it up. It's going to pull up here. Oh, I'm in a different browser. Hang on. B A R T L E, I think. Is it? I think it's only one. Yeah, it's one. Yeah, it's one T. B A R T L E. So just Bartle space taxonomy, and there's a lot of different visual representations of it. But the most basic version is this is character theory chart. You have people who uh, like to. Ex- you've got the players in the world. You got acting and interacting. So you got a little uh, sector there, and then in each of these quadrants. You would have killers, so you have acting and players, killers, acting and world, achievers, uh, world and interacting, explorers, interacting and players, socializers. So that's where, depending upon what you're doing, what they like to do, that kind of helps you. And, um, you know, you're starting to get in personality theory, right, which 
is a whole morass unto itself. I don't know how many you've taken psych classes and had to take uh, psych uh, uh, theory on um, personalities. I had to take multiple uh, personality courses and such as part of my degree training. And, um, you know, you get into union archetypes and you get into all of the, um, the, the, um, the personality tests, the, um, of course I'm going to blank on it now, the EMTG and EM, EM, it's all based on union stuff, but I forget, let's see, EMTJ, EMMP, um, well, they give you the letter codes, yeah, yeah it's the personality, yeah, personality test, um, yeah, it's Jung and Brig Briggs Myers. It's the Briggs Myers uh, t uh, indicator, uh, personality type indicator. And what's that? I was like, it's B something. Yeah, Briggs Myers. I just, I, I was blanking. I always remember the union that it's based on, but I always forget the people who put it together. And this is way overused in businesses. Way overused. And it is lazy HR people who do it. I'm sorry. See, I have a big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I have my opinion, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> but but seriously, it is people don't even get their resume even looked at because of this test, and it was not supposed to be used that way. It was supposed to be useful information to say, well, you're kind of more in this area and this area, but it's all forced. How, how many of you guys have taken the the Myers Briggs Briggs Myers personal test? Mark, there is a button to raise your hand, by the way. <laughs> Raise, lower your hand is a, is an option. It, it it pops up a little. That's usually for it says for somebody to speak. Uh, but have you uh, have you taken that before, Mark? Uh, no, I don't okay, D Danielle, I assume you have. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, many times. Um, so you can always you can go take a number of these online and take light versions of them for free. What's that? And then there's the more extensive versions that cost. It's actually an expensive test to use, and you have to buy it in bulk and such. But it can. It the problem is it's forced choice. So do you like to hang out with people, or do you like to stay at home and read a book? That's one of your choices. When you're at a party, do you feel a lot of anxiety, or do you feel energized by it? One choice. You have to choose one. Well, some days we feel one way. Some days we feel the other way. One year I was having a bad year, didn't want to see anybody. The other year I couldn't get enough of people. What do I answer, right? Because these are supposed to be overall life questions. As they overall the aggregate, what do you feel right now? So these tests have a lot of problems with them. They don't hold up on validity and reliability in real research. And they're a little bit froofy, new agey kind of really is kind of what they become. And, but business is way overusing them. You, there are so many job apps that are online now that you, in fact, even Indeed has it, where employers require you to take the test as your application. You will never even get to speak to somebody, and you're supposed to be answering these questions. So the only reason I bring that up is we have to be careful about that with the same thing with player type, um, with the uh, Bartle taxonomy and stuff. Just because you overall prefer to be a killer, murder hobo, whatever, doesn't mean that's all you ever want to do, that you're stereotyped locked into this. Um, I'm going to kill people in a social setting. Yeah. And, you know, a big problem with this one is on the introvert side. So a lot of HR people believe that if you're an introvert, you're not a team player, and you should not work for the company. A lot of HR people will filter you out. You're saying no, that they're wrong, or no, that you don't know HR uh, people do that. No, I, that, that they're wrong, because there's yeah. people that... They oh, yeah, like, they're totally wrong. They're dead wrong. <laughs> I mean, they kind of have good people skills, but those might be the no, people no. that See, that's, doing the data. That work. right there is a myth. Introverts are not automatically socially inept. Exactly. Right. So to say they don't have good people skills, though. Well, yeah, but that's how they're looking at right. it. Right. You know, and that's the mistake. Now, what does happen, is if you're an introvert and you don't learn to stretch, so, so now the current theory is introverts and extroverts kind of continue, like everything's on a spectrum nowadays. Mm -hmm. And you have kind of this in between where this side is uh, introvert and this side is extrovert. Mm -hmm. um, and, mo and the theory is most <coughs> people have a set point where they re exert the least psychic energy. And psychic, we just mean psychological. Mm -hmm. We don't mean ESP or, sure. you know. Uh, uh, um, Actually, sensory perception? Um, no, D&D. &D, um, 
Psionics? Psionics. We don't mean psionics and ESP and stuff like that. I could tie it back into gaming every chance I get. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it just means that it doesn't require effort. So if you're an introvert, you like hanging out by the fire reading a book or hanging out in the woods and just being, you know, that's a whole other nature deficit disorder conversation. That's, that's another conversation. Um, other people go to parties and that's where they get revved up. They, they hang out with friends. They love to chat. And that just, they've had a long day at work and the less, the, the, all they want to do is just go hang out with people at the bar or whatever and just chat. And it makes their day and it recharges them. They feel ready to take on another day. But even that situation, I mean, you know. Well, that's the set point we're talking about. Like uh, and yes, yes, Marvel some days, yeah, right, every day, game. every day is going to be different, but this mm -hmm. is the overall average set point. But what happens is we all learn to move that around. We learn to stretch. Mm -hmm. So extroverts have to spend time alone from sometimes. If they don't, then there's mental health issues where like codependency, I can't be alone. Don't go, don't go out the door. I have to go with the everywhere. Will you keep a camera on? I need, you know, that's a mental health issue. But it's, it's an exaggeration <laughs> of an extrovert you know, needing that constant contact. They don't. It, even extroverts can, can get burned out. But when they go over to the introvert side where they have to work alone in a hallway or something, like they're a contractor, and they have to work eight hours a day, five days a week, nobody talks to them because they're a contractor, nobody knows them in this hallway. By the end of the week, they're feeling pretty down. They feel exhausted. They feel often high levels of depression. There was just that article just today. Uh, I think it was on Facebook. But it was... Um, um, about feeling belonging to an organization that was talking about belonging to fandom groups and stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, helping reduce depression and stuff. But that's old news. I mean, I, I she knows new news, news and I'm like, duh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But there's a big deal about like, duh. <laughs> anyway, so an extrovert then will at the end of the week go party hard to try to recharge and feel connected and all of that. Um, because they're, it's, it's wearing them out to be alone. An introvert could do that job and be like, hey, it's great. I love this job. I don't have to deal with people. I don't have to deal with customers. I don't have to deal with boss most of the time. I get my work done, and I go home. And then, you know, every now and then I can go hang out with my friends, you know, play a game or go to the bar or whatever it is, uh, or go on a motorcycle trip, etc. cetera. Um, but if they work in a location, let's say, they, let's say they work in a bar as a server, and they have to socialize all the time, Danielle. <laughs> they have to socialize all the time, all day long, five days a week. They can do it, and they can become very good at it because they've actually had to work at it and develop it as a skill. It's not just automatic gregariousness. They are aware, I have to do this to do my job. But when they go home, they're like, just leave me alone. I need to recharge. Let me go soak in the tub or go by the fire, whatever. Just let me recharge. And so you're stretching, and it's all about the stretching across from your set point. And some people have to stretch more than others to get into the um, extrovert from the introvert mode, and vice versa. And like any other skill, the more you do it, the better you get at it. You know, flexing those muscles in a way. When you practice and push yourself as an introvert to socialize more, it gets easier. You're still going to have your preference, but it gets easier to do more of it. We're an extrovert, and you need to get work done because when you socialize all the time, you're struggling to get stuff done if you're not working together as a group. you got to pull yourself away from that and focus on working alone. You, the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. And we're not, we're not talking ADHD and stuff here. We're just talking just the distraction of socializing, So, which can be a very powerful tool if it's done collaboratively. But if you get all these friends who always want to talk to you all the time, which you love talking to them, but it's a distraction from you doing your work, you better focus on your work. Um, so, same thing with these Bartle uh, player types. Um, we got these whole spectrum. Just because somebody scores really high on killer, murder, hobo, doesn't mean they won't enjoy potentially some achieving, some exploring, some socializing. You do get the occasional rare extreme player. You do get John Cena, we've all seen them, who really are really in that upper corner of the quadrant. That's all they want to do. They just want to kill stuff. And if you get to know them a little more and do a little bit of psychology, you start to find out there's things in our life that go, ah, that really explains that motivation. And it only works when you, you know, have an ongoing rapport and you learn to watch for it that way. And if you can find that, because when people are in that far corner, that's really not healthy, no matter what it is. When they're that extreme, whether we're talking politics, religion, sex, like all the forbidden topics... Yeah. Gaming, when you go that extreme, when you get into extreme, rigid thoughts and behaviors, that is unhealthy. 
you know, we have to have some balance to our lives. It's all homeostasis. And so when you find somebody who's really extreme and one, like somebody's only a socializer <coughs> and won't do any of the combat and everything, they might have some trauma in their life. That might be actually what's going on. And they avoid all kinds of conflict. They, they Maybe their parents argued all the time and they just totally avoid all conflict and don't like any physical conflict. And so we'll do everything they can to talk their way through and only like to play games that work that way. Right, right. Um, you know, and then achievers who only kind of want to f bury themselves in, in solving the problems and don't want to deal with the social stuff or the violence or whatever. They just want to bury themselves in the problem. You start to find when these people score, so these scores are useful as indicators. They are not defining, but they are useful indicators, just like the personality stuff. If somebody scores, the problem with the Myers-Briggs is it doesn't really give you, it gives you all these 16 types. It doesn't give you a range. The ones that give you more of a gradient are more useful on different assessment tools. When you see somebody's really outside the norm, that's something you can potentially address. Because a lot of times, there is some specific sticking point there that's pushed them to that corner. Um, a lot of them, it's because of bad experiences with other gamers and other GMs. A lot of players have run into have gone to these extremes because they had such a bad experience with another type that it drove them away and they went more and more into this one direction with each bad experience. And so you have to kind of nudge them out of their corner, if you will. <laughs> and then they can have a better gaming experience and they experience all this other stuff that before they were kind of afraid to do, even though they didn't realize. Now, I'm oversimplifying in all these statements, of course. I'm hugely generalizing. But these are some interesting things to, to be aware of. An interesting side and, um, Yes, Danielle. Go ahead. Okay, John. So now, of course, it's just a, a, a side note. Um, Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition has stated in the works that they are working off three pillars, which are three of the four of Bartles. They have combat, social, and exploration. Um, the event, D&D Adventures League modules, uh, especially more now than previously, but at least in season eight, and I think maybe some season seven have specifically put at the end of each section for the module uh, how to handle the combat pillar, how to handle the social pillar, or how to handle the exploration pillar for each of those scenarios. Cool. So people could focus on the part they want to Right, do. right. Uh, Danielle? a bunch of the important things so that way they don't get lost. Um, we might also want to really quickly touch base on the um, interaction patterns and the hair inherent in uh, recreation. Avidon interaction patterns? Yep. Okay. So on, and this is something even other recreation therapists, I've been shocked how many recreation therapists don't remember the Avidon interaction patterns. Oh, that's not it. No. Um, <laughs> Were you there, Danielle, when I did that in front of uh, Wastra and nobody yeah. there knew Abaddon? Yeah. I was just like, people. <laughs> it's like Emily raising her hand. And she's like, yeah. <laughs> so that's A-V-E-D-O-N, Abaddon Interaction Pattern. So if you just go to rpcresearch.com, in the search box, just type Abaddon. You will get a PDF. That's what I got. What's that? Right. Um, in Google, if you just type Avidon and RPG, you'll probably find my papers. So there's a PDF there, and there's also a, a GIF-type image. Um, uh, so anybody who's watching, you can follow along on the website. Mark, you can do the same thing. Go to rpgresearch.com, just type in, yeah, let's technically, this is a PDF, but it can get in GIF and JPEG. It doesn't GIF have to have movement? No, that was a feature of the graphics interchange format. That is not a requirement. It, what GIF did is reduce the number of pixels necessary to show an image by doing a lot of neighboring pixel. Uh, uh, the algorithm does neighboring. All right, total tangent, sorry. My <laughs> <laughs> computer no science background. <laughs> We're here about RPG <laughs> science. What? I put the link in the chat for Okay, great. Um, and anybody on Twitch or the video, or you knocked your chair over. 
completely. Wow. Right, right to the wall. Well, the, the, the green wall. Yeah. The fourth one. The invisible wall. <laughs> so, uh, so you'll see that there. Um, when I get the other big screen back, I have Chromecast, so I'll be able to cast it to the screen and the uh, broadcast, so everybody will see what I'm seeing. But for now, um, oh wait, I'm got Jitsi. I can share my screen. Well, I'm jumping into. Oh, that's a problem. Oh. Never mind. Because you have multiple levels of Jitsi open? I don't know. Okay. Let me, okay, that's muted. We have the Jitsi Inception here. Okay, let's see if it works. Okay, there. All right. All right. So, if... It keeps unmuting. All right, here we go. I want to... Share my screen. Full screen. Oh, let's share a YouTube video. I thought I could share my screen. I got share a YouTube video. View full screen? No, that's just the... What happened to the share my screen feature? Alright, well, I'll fiddle that out of time. Um, yeah, it's not... But you found the, uh, what was that? Okay, that's, that's, why didn't I see it? Can we move this? I think my window's too big. I keep getting these stupid pop-ups. Open, close, start subtitles, raise lower hand. I'm not. So you are seeing a share screen option? Yes, I have uh, share your screen that has uh, raise lower your hand. And open. Yeah, I don't have a share screen option. It's not there. Maybe you need to make it full screen. So you can see it. Weird. What browser are you in? That might be why, because I was in Chrome. Let me switch to that. I don't. It just was open at the time. Who's there? I have four browsers. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, could give me pop-ups. Oh my goodness! Stop with the pop-up windows. <laughs> There he is. There's share screen. Yeah, it's just not there under Chrome. Hmm. Weird. Good to know. Yeah. Select window. Avanon. What's that? Maybe. All right. So now, hopefully. You say security. I say collective. Oh, did I say that? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I don't see it showing up on there, though. Those who give up freedom for security deserve neither. Yeah. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin. Um, why isn't it? Can you guys see the screen I shared? Okay. So I have it on action patterns. It's just blank. Weird. All right, I'll have to fiddle in no time because it's not, it's not doing it. Anyway, it, it, as long as you can pull it up in your browser and look at it, it's really easy to find. So it's just a one page. I took, I took like twelve pages of content and condensed down to one page. And you'll hear me mention these Avidon interaction patterns uh, from time to time, and they're related to play style, uh, play format, um, the different sectors. So all these things we already covered, they're related to these things. So intra-individual is an action taking place within the mind of a person or action involving the mind and part of the body, but requiring no contact with another person or external object. So meditation, daydreaming, ruminating, things like that, those are all intra-individual. It's inside your head. 
um, the uh, art and each of these I added RPG application. So to try to transition to extra individual, so it could be the beginning process of your thinking stuff in your head before you say something, you're visualizing, etc. Uh, you read uh, adventure stories to, you read previously adventure stories to participate, and um, you've had experiences and you're trying, you're going back through your head, reliving them, or you're coming up with problems. Um, also trying to monitor, create some facial or other reaction in yourself. Uh, becoming aware of your own body state, etc., related to situation. Not not a heavy use in RPG, but that's how you could kind of tie that. There is an intra-individual experience for each player at the table and the GM at the table. There's a stuff going on in your head, um, and that's about it. <laughs> Extra individual. Action directed by a person toward an object on the environment requiring no contact with another person. So I put an asterisk by those that are kind of the primary application of this and then sometimes there's other variants and in this case RPG application would be SABM and I've got to update my abbreviations on here uh, any kind of SRPG oh yeah yeah uh, which is solo role-playing games of any kind solo computer role-playing game solo adventure books modules any kind of solo role-playing game uh, that's going to apply to you're going to read a book you're going to play the module you're going to play the video game uh, you can do solo LARP slurp <laughs> you can go out in the woods and pretend to adventure yourself, whatever. Um, why not? Kids do it all the time. That's slurp, not slarp. <laughs> I was thinking solo larp, slarp. <laughs> anyway, so that's extra individual. And, you know, painting miniature by yourself, things like those are all things. Aggregate. Action directed by a person toward an object in the environment while in the company of other persons who are also directing action toward objects in the environment, but action is not directed toward one another, and no interaction between participants is required necessary. So a very cliche one would be everybody's come to paint um, uh, plaster figurines. And you're in an assembly table here, or you're in a classroom, and everybody's painting their own figurine, or it could be a game miniature or whatever, but you're not doing it with each other. You're doing it, you're, you're all doing the same activity simultaneously, but you're not really interacting with each other. You're doing your own thing, even though you're all side by side. Would everyone like train their character if they're not? As long as you're not interacting with others, asking questions and things like that. Yes. If you're not, if you don't know what the other is doing, and you're not making choices based on what they're doing, then yes, it would apply that. Um, Did you just say um, making a character? Yeah, making a character. Like if you're all making characters, but usually. Yeah, I Mind. Right, but usually the character making process, there's a lot of back and forth between the players and the GM. Just as an aside, I will say it is fun to make characters, or make make the players make characters, and you, they they don't tell each other. Yes, I I, I, I prefer that because I I don't like it when people make a character based on somebody else's character. I much prefer that you're all brought together and you had no idea what. Oh well, I mean, like the instance that you know, no one thought to create a cleric, for instance. Right. Or, yeah. <laughs> or the time when half your party. Chooses druids and the other half chooses elves. Yes, I've had groups that are all fighters, or all magic users. I'm like, well, you guys are birds of a feather. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> and actually, actually, I like I like uh, mono class groups because it really stretches them out. Of, you can't afford to all be playing the same cliche. You're all going to have to come up with variants on that class of idea to survive. Yeah, somebody's going to have to be a battle medic. <laughs> <laughs> or play very differently rather than follow the old tropes of what you need in a gaming group because I that that is something that's really a byproduct of computer gaming much more than tabletop gaming and that's fed back into tabletop gaming prior to that that was not you did not have to have all of these key things to do a successful campaign people have fallen in this trap that you must have this 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 and this and that's really because of computer games feeding back into the tabletop game. They have generations of that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah this like, whole mandatory party balance thing, I go, Pfft. Yeah, there's a game I'm thinking of that specifically tells you, oh, you guys have no healers, so right. I'm choose one. Or yeah. Well, damn Yeah, and that's all gaming the game. And that's fine. You know, there, it has its place, but people get constrained by it, and I think they do themselves a disservice when they let that happen. It's great to know it, but then move on beyond it. It's kind of a, it's a foundational thing that people get stuck in. Uh, uh, so extra individual would include, uh, sorry, aggregate would include 
everybody doing solo adventure books or modules side by side, doing miniatures, solo role playing. Everybody playing a, a Dragon Age <laughs> on the computer, right? They're not playing together, but they're they're each playing the same game. And you could add competitive variants after. How far did you get? Did you find this thing after? And then that's no longer aggregate, but at the time it's happening, it's aggregate. And so when, when we were talking about um, creating characters, if like, the GM's helping them, that wouldn't be... That would not be aggregate, because okay. you're interacting with others. Mm-hmm. So it's one thing, like, a teacher hands out all the figurines and gives you the painting materials and then steps back, mm-hmm. then it's aggregate. But if you're constantly getting help from the teacher or a neighboring person, then that's no longer aggregate. You're interacting with other people um, to do the activity. Well, then we get into inter-individual, or, or unilateral, yeah, but inter-individual. Inter-individual is action of a competitive nature directed by one person toward another. Really strong emphasis on competitive on the rest of these versus one of them. Um, so application, very commonly computer game or co- collectible card games, tradable card games. Now, who was it saying that CCG is trademarked? I couldn't find any evidence of that. I Googled it. I didn't find any Was it Dan evidence. who said that? Yeah, I think Dan said it was the, the phrase. I might have brought something up to that answer, too. I don't think but. that. Yeah, I... Is that a category? Did you say TCG or CCG? CCG. You, um, collectible card game. Oh. Issue. And the fact... You're saying that Magic, that Magic the Gathering trademarked that or something. I think I might have brought that up when we were doing that. Yeah. No, you, you don't know with trademarks. Things like that happen. People do... It, Gene Simmons trademarked the term Axe, so... Yeah, I don't know. But anyway, a collectible card game or a, a tradable card game is a very typical example of inter-individual competitive. Um, others we play by post. Some are competitive, some are not. Uh, PvP areas. So whether it's tabletop, live action, or computer, the PvP areas would all fit, player versus player. That's not player versus everyone. That's PvP specifically mm-hmm. in more pegs and in LARP, etc. But it's only one-on-one, not more than one. Unilateral, action of a competitive nature among three or more persons, one of whom is an antagonist, or it. So, tag. Um, by the way, Avedon, this is all from 1974. So, RPG application. Play by post, group versus player, tabletop. Um, doesn't usually happen, but you do see if there's some modules where one player is playing... Uh, an antagonist that all the other characters have to out, they play the villain, or they're the, the they're the traitor in the group, whether it's known or unknown. Um, not great. You have to be careful because it can really destroy a group when you create competition in a tabletop game. Could that be the GM being the antagonist? It could be, and that's usually also unhealthy. Usually, if the GM is seen as an antagonist, that usually poisons a group as well. Like GM versus player that, not that a you've game. got a problem. Like, you've you're got trouble. About a player being a villain, what about, like, the GM but if it's agreed that that's so there are some games out there currently, tabletop games it's, it's, and others, where it is agreed that one person is playing the villain. And there's some new card games and stuff that come out like yeah. that too. Where one place plays the villain and they have to outsmart the, that person and the GM goes back and forth between what they're doing and what they're doing and you go back and forth. And they can be fun games as long as it's understood and agreed and you play with those rules. But if it happens in the group, you know, because of unhealthy dynamics, that's a problem. Uh, I've got one in my hands. What? I've got one in my hands. Which one? Uh, it is called uh, Nyctophobia. With Nyctophobia? Yep. Your players are blindfolded and you have one person who's like a GM who is trying to kill you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kill your character, right? Yeah. Okay. Hopefully. Hopefully. But it feels yeah. like it's trying to kill you because you're blindfolded. The whole Lovely. Time. Wow. This is an anti-therapy game. A game that you require therapy. This is how you traumatize players into those corners. <laughs> uh, group versus player, more pegs. So um, that would be like all the players against a boss if the boss is played by a player. Right, so for example, um, the classic Neverwinter Nights lets the GM take over some of the NPCs. Um, You could easily do the same thing with letting another player take over and be one of the NPCs, and the the group is going against that. Um, And of course, a LARP group versus player, King of the Mountain. Right, you know, there's there's all sorts of variants you can have. Again, none of these are asterisks because generally unilateral doesn't fit the RPG model. 
Mm. Right? I don't have any of those asterisks. That is not your typical RPG experience. Typical RPG is, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, multilateral. Action of a competitive nature among three or more persons, and that's going to overlap when we talk about Tuckman group dynamics and small group formation in a period of time. Um, action of a competitive nature among three or more persons with no one person as an antagonist. So this is every person for themselves. Everybody against everybody. Uh, arena, combat, things like that. Just everybody against everybody. Uh, again, can be play by post, can be player versus player, table talk, can be player versus player, more big, player versus player, LARP. Again, no asterisk on that. It's not the primary form of role-playing game format to do everybody against everybody. That's usually other types of games. But you do have some hybrids and variants on it that let you do that. Uh, but really not the primary form of role-playing game. So no asterisk on that either. And again, this helps, I think, in defining what is a role-playing game, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's primary attributes versus kind of <coughs> extensions beyond what it really is at the core. Um, and I'm going to jump over the next one because I'm going to come to the last one, which is I'm going to jump to intergroup. Action of a competitive nature between two or more groups. I'm leaving out the keyword for the moment. So RPG application would be group versus group tabletop, which you don't see very often, but it's not unheard of. Group versus group more pegs. You see that all the time with Guild Wars and things like that. And LARPs. You see that a lot, especially the big battle boffer LARPs. And I have an asterisk by LARP because that is very common to have groups versus groups at, going at each other. RPG sports. Yeah. Try the D&D group versus group. Yeah. And, and I've done it. It, it, it. You can do it, but it is not the, the core nature of a role-playing game to do that. And LARP, it is pretty normal. The final one is really the one before in Avedon's list, but I was skipping over it because it's different than the others. Intragroup. Action of a cooperative nature. So notice out of all of these listed, this is the only one out of eight interaction patterns that says cooperative in the description. Action of a cooperative nature by two or more persons intent upon reaching a mutual goal. Action requires positive verbal and nonverbal interaction. That, to me, is the most powerful sentence in that whole paper. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> to me, that's really big. It's just like... <coughs> what? That was an aha moment for me. Yeah, it was related to when when I read. Oh, they're in there out front. Can you grab the cookbook? It's it's either yep. going to be in that that suitcase out front or scattered around. But you know what the cookbook looks like. Yep, I know the cookbook. Okay, I was looking at it today. Um, yeah, when I borrowed from you. And then let's we'll see. Besides the cookbook, there was the intro. Uh, also, the introduction to direct therapy. The, it's a blue one called introduction to direct therapy. Or therapy, right? Um, there was a, in, in the intro to direct therapy. There was a whole thing, and then later in the cookbook, it said over and over, there is a shortage of cooperative activities in recreation therapy because people find it difficult to motivate participants to do activities if there isn't an element of competition. And every time I tell them, well, role playing games, we don't have any problem. We're working cooperatively. We don't, we don't need any competition. And in fact, often if the competition goes too far, it ruins it. Uh, why don't you guys consider role-playing games? And nobody in TR had ever done that. And that was what, in 2004, started that whole path. Um, there's another one that was the introduction there to... There's no Betty Crocker. Yeah, there's another one that's introduction to recreation therapy or therapy recreation. Uh, it's kind of a beat-up, bluish book, I think. You can uh, grab that okay. to you. Introduction to rec recreation therapy or introduction to therapy recreation. I can't remember okay. which. Just look for the blue book introduction. Yeah. So in here, so we call this the cookbook in, in TR language. There's a number of, there's like four key recreation therapy books we reference all the time because they are directly applicable to uh, improving your role-playing game experience. Now, these are textbooks. And they are heavy content. They are for recreation therapists working on the certifications and such and going through the degree. Much of what we model is on the, a lot of the TR stuff. Because it's the best profession. I, you know, I've studied a whole bunch of different branches of psychology, neuroscience, social sciences, computer science, a lot of different areas. This is the closest fit to trying to, to work out how role-playing games work and how to improve them and such. It's the closest match um, of all these TR, the series of TR books. 
Uh, the ones that I'll reference are the cookbook. I've got the red book. This is an older version. This is all assessment tools for recreation. So this is really, really, really good for assessing if you're doing your games well and such. Whether you're, whether you're doing it for therapy or not, it can just be useful for doing better games. Uh, and then we have what's been a blue book but broken into three books, uh, which is the International Classification of Functioning um, the Recreation Therapy Handbook. And I've been trying to create the RPG Handbook of Function, uh, 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 Therapeutic Handbook, uh, using all of the World Health Organization ICF International Classification of Functioning Codes. So that if somebody's at, so if you're a zero, you have no impairment on your disability, right? If you have, dis, if you have impairment, zero means no, it doesn't show up as a problem. You might have muscular sclerosis, but it doesn't affect you yet. You just got the diagnosis. A one is you have some impairment, probably don't need a lot of help, but it's there. Four is complete impairment. You can't do the activity without aid, either a mechanical or, or somebody else to help. And then two and three are in between those. Uh, it's worth note to say that those are also broken down under the other categories. Yeah, there's lots of subcategories, and, and you've got all these codes, and ultimately it's about insurance. So you got to say, like, B9300, 9342.2. You know, and I don't remember what that is, but B is going to be body, and ninety three is going to be some sort like gas, like digestion or something, and then it'll be like the the esophagus part, and then impairment is point two or something, right? So it's very much granular like that. But if you read the code and cross reference it, and if you're in a field where you see it all the time, you'll go, oh, I know what that means. Mm. And then as a program designer, I know what their limitations are. Mm. I'm not going to try to make them lift a 50-pound object if they're at a at level 3 impairment of upper body strength. Mm -hmm. Their range of motion is, you know, impaired because of cerebral palsy. Nope. That's the only book with the word introduction in it. Oh, it was a blue hardcover that's all beat up. Oh, well, well, maybe I've got it somewhere else. Sorry. All right, well, they need to come back in here anyway. Topic later? Yeah. yeah. Well, not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> there's so much content. So... So, cookbook, red book, blue book, what am I forgetting of the core TR books? Um, uh, red book? I already said red book. Yeah, red book, blue, blue book, and cookbook. I mean, well, um, if you were going to be on Deserted Island, those would be the three books you would want uh, if you got no three other books if you were going to do TR. Right. Uh, Deserted Island makes no sense. I know, it makes no sense. But you know what the point is. But your recreational therapy project today is to make a raft. Mark, did you have a question so far? What? She's trying to tell us which one you're missing. Yeah, I still didn't make out what, what you were saying as what I'm missing. The one that you are writing for. Oh, my book. <laughs> okay, not counting my books, the purple book and stuff, yeah. Oh, really, your book. The one you're oh, oh, the, the Dottillo Penn State one. Yeah. The facilitation yeah. techniques in therapy regression. Okay, yeah, that. so I've been asked to write a chapter for this for Penn State oh. on RPG therapy. What's that? You're missing the other facilitation one. Yeah, I, I have it. I, I have it back here. No, but it's so your list you're Okay. I, I don't know. Um, but that's fine. That's fine. Thanks for reading. So intergroup, that is a, that's, that, it changes every edition, so it's not consistent. Um, by the way, I did order uh, one of, I'm going to get them one at a time. Though, since they broke into three books, I have ordered some of those that were broken into three, so those will start arriving soon. So I'll be more... Well, I have the first one and the last one. Okay, well, I'm going to one by one just get them anyway, so... Uh, <coughs> so intergroup, cooperative. So RPG application, playbook host. Tabletop role-playing gaming, by far the most cooperative of all of them all. Uh, LARP can be cooperative if you're not doing buffer and such. There's lots of cooperative LARPs. Mm -hmm. You know, you're solving mysteries together, what have you. The DM's laid down clues. There's lots of uh, cooperative LARPs. Uh, more pegs, you know, you get, you, everybody gets together in your guild and goes against the bad guy and such. And you're playing cooperatively against the creatures there. Uh, but by far the most cooperative is a tabletop role-playing game. 
you depend on each other to play the game. You cannot play it as a normal TRPG, as an original RPG, without relying and cooperating with others. The others you could kind of play by yourself. Maybe LARP, you know, you could argue, but... A little sociopath sort of way, though. So... I think people have super LARP by themselves. Yes, yes, we can definitely do that. Um, and people do play TRPGs by themselves without doing a solo adventure book or module. Um, but it's not usually very fulfilling. <laughs> um, so... Takes up a lot of graph paper, too. Yes. <laughs> well, that's that's GMing. That's a whole other thing. Yeah, uh, layers and layers of yes. We will, any GM who's done it has been there. Yeah. Uh, so that's the eight Avedon inter- interaction patterns. You will start to hear that overlap with when we talk about. We're not going to go into it very far. When we talk about Tuckman's theory on group dynamics and group, small group formation, there's a lot of overlap between Avedon interaction patterns and forming, storming, norming, performing. Adjoining and reforming. That's intentionally mispronounced as adjoining because you're just trying to keep the alliteration. And uh, so successful communication in groups and teams. This is mostly in the business world that you see this. Uh, Project management especially. Not just tech, just any business that you work on projects cooperatively with people. And the key thing is that it has to be three or more people and usually not more than nine. Otherwise, you start breaking into separate teams. Mm. So this is your small team that you're working with. Now, football's different than big teams. Mm. But but in, for the most part, in business and such, your most effective groups are a size of three to nine and because uh, you get your specialists that can learn to work together. You have to learn to work together. Mm. And that's really hard to do. You get a lot of egos and personalities and other things you don't, can't stand about each other and bad habits and blah, 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 blah. But you got to learn to work together or a project will fail. And so you go through these forming, storming, norming, performing phases and then later on we tacked on adjoining and reforming. You, could, you, you will never watch role-playing games the same way once you learn this. You, every time you're jamming a group or you're watching a group, you're going to start seeing, especially if you're following from beginning through, where a gaming group is at in these stages. And I do it in our Sunday show as that group's been progressing and still struggling to get out of the storming phase into the norming and performing phase. Um... I talk about it in the show, like, oh, that's really a stormy moment there for the group, isn't it? So uh, we've got probably just enough time. Uh, the other book that we, we, we mentioned this all the time is Flow State. So I mentioned Mihai Csikszentmihalyi and the theory of Flow State. Now, spelling this is next to impossible because it's Hungarian. It looks like Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. Yeah, it's pronounced it's Mihai Chiksent Mihai. And it looks nothing like that. Mihai Chiksent Mihai. Is the A and L silent in the first name? It's Hungarian. Mihai. And don't get me going to the whole Monty Python Hungarian phrase book, if anybody remembers that, those skits. So it is spelled M I, if, if somebody's watching who has a visual impairment. It's M-I-H-A-L-Y, watching, listening, excuse me. M-I-H-A-L-Y is the first name for Mihai. Csikszent Mihai is C-S-I-K-S-Z-E-N-T-M-I-H-A-L-Y-I. So he's part of the positive psychology trend that started in the 50s and such that came from uh, Carl Rogers um, and uh, 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 the pyramid... Um, Maslow. Maslow, yeah, Maslow, yeah. Carl Rogers, all of that. He's part of that ongoing group. And he has a lot of, he has this, I got the compiled works. He's got about 10 different great papers in here. Um, some of them I agree with, some of them I don't. Um, but the key thing, and this is what's critical to both uh, recreation therapy and specifically role playing gaming, is his piece on flow state. And flow state, I have a 10 minute video, which, is, which will be in your list, but you can go on YouTube and just type in. YouTube, sorry, uh, flow state, flow space state space RPG, or role playing game. You'll find my ten minute lecture or so, which gives you a great summary. And Danielle says it was very helpful for her and others uh, for their tests. Basically, it's being in the zone. Sports people talk about being in the zone. Loss of time is a big part of flow state. Wow, two hours went by. It felt like half an hour. I can't believe two hours went by. Um, undistracted by stimuli. I was talking about how I'll throw a book on the floor, slam a door, 
to see how <laughs> immersed the group is. If they're not responding to stimuli, that's a high indicator that they may be in flow state. Um, it's, so according to his theories, it's the ideal state for learning. You're at a maximal level, and, and there's a whole chart for this, you're at a maximal level of challenge within the range of your competence that's just pushing you a little bit beyond without causing so much anxiety that you're overwhelmed. So it's exactly the right amount of stress without being too far for your level of capability. And that is very dynamic with each individual where that works. So our goal that we all these tools are used for is try to maximize immersion for the players so that they have the best opportunities for flow state in the game, whatever the format. Because what we found is whether it's recreation, entertainment, education, or therapeutic, that's where we get the greatest results. If it's entertainment, they had the best time. If it's recreation, they had the best time. Comradeships build, etc. If it's educational, research is showing, and I'm testing more of that, but research is showing that they will both, it will sink in with enough connections, enough neural connections to have the best recall, both short term and long term. They will remember the data and information far better if they did learn it in flow state than in other states, either higher stress or lower stress. Um, and then a therapeutic, that it's your best chance for learning and developing and, and pushing yourself outside of your old areas and growing and building confidence and efficacy and, and, and all of that. So flow state is a theoretical construct, but the what it covers is very, very powerful potential. And so we try to, everything I do in trying to improve the role-playing game experience is about trying to get people to that flow state. So every little nitpicky thing I pick on, hey, work on your energy, hey, work on your voice, hey, you know, keep track of this, work on your timing, whatever, is about optimizing that for the players and the GM. Because the GM can get in flow state too. And what's really cool, and I see it every now and then, where everybody's in flow state, or as far as I can tell, and then they report back, you know, when you can really tell when everybody goes, whoa, it's over already? Holy, you know, it, when everybody's reaction is that, we're like, yeah, 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 you guys were there. Like, that was the best time I ever had. You don't, know, you rarely get all the way to full flow state in any one game. But what we found is we get people to a high enough immersion to get to some level of flow state within about 45 minutes to 90 minutes is kind of the zone. It takes a while for people to ramp up and get, you know, quit BSing and pay attention and get going. And sometimes it can happen in 15 to 30 minutes, but on average, 45 to 90 minutes, you can get there. Then you want to sustain it. And what we found, what I've found, and, and I think you would be pretty much in agreement, is you can't sustain that much longer than about three to four hours total. Like the whole game cycle, when you start getting along in that, you need breaks, which is going to disrupt it. Um, you, you know, you're going to get blood clots. Yeah, you got to go to the bathroom, blood clots, what have you. After about three to four hours, you're kind of pushing it. Uh, now, some organizations, they stop at just 90 minutes. You're just starting to get the optimal experience. It's okay. It's understandable, especially with younger kids. So, for example, with No Thank You Evil, the little kids get there right away. So they can be there in 5 to 15 minutes, and your game session's half an hour for one adventure. And you can do two or three adventures in about an hour and a half. And that makes sense for younger kids. 5 to 10-year-olds get squirmy, and they're not gonna, you're not going to want to do a three-hour straight session with them necessarily. It depends on the kid, of course. But we're generalizing here. Um, so for younger groups like that and kids with attention deficit disorder, things like that, that haven't yet developed better focus skills, you can get them there, but they're not there yet, then the shorter 30 to 90 minute things might work better, especially if you can do more frequency. So if it's once a week, we recommend three to four hours, three hours kind of sweet spot, as long as you're really optimizing it. Otherwise, if there's a lot of, if it takes a while to get going, then make it four hours, because you want that three hour time, time slot, two and a half hours, three hours of play. So then you can get 90 plus minutes of potential flow state in each session. And that's a great experience for everybody when you get that. So this talks a lot about that. Um, okay, a few more minutes. So forming, storming, norming, performing. I'm going to quickly go over the highlights of those four because I. it's a constant term. And again, you're going to hear where it ties in with uh, the Avidon interaction patterns. So let's check before we can go over that. So in just a few minutes, I'm going to be reading pretty quickly. Um, it, it, the key thing is small group is three to nine. They explain why. We won't worry about that right now, but three to nine is what some argued larger, some argued smaller, but we'll call it three to nine. For gaming, we say four to five is the sweet spot. You can run games larger. You can run games smaller. 
four to five is kind of sweet spot for your players. So you have your GM and four to five players. Seems to be just the right amount. You get enough rotation and taking turns. It doesn't take too long. You resolve it. You have enough variety of personalities and approaches. Because you only have three. It's you're missing something. It always feels like there's something missing. You start to hit six. The game starts to slow down. Four to five. And a lot of GMs are already, like, a lot of stuff we say, like, well, duh, I already know there's a GM. It was done intuitively. But we're trying to draw on research that validates why these things are happening. So then we can do the knobs and dials to optimize. Um, so we won't talk about teams and networks and ethos, logos, pathos. Uh, so then it gets into self or intrapersonal communication. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Interpersonal communication, small group communication, public communication, mass communication. We're interested in small group communication out of those. But you see some of the overlap with Abaddon there again. Um, when we're broadcasting, it's mass communication. That's more on the entertainment side. Mm -hmm. When we're talking recreation, we're definitely talking uh, small group communication. All right. Um, there's a number of paradoxes, which we'll, we'll, when we do this in more depth another time, um, we'll talk about. Uh, primary groups, secondary groups, we'll talk about that more later. Uh, families, adolescents, where is Ask such a uh, Resistance to teams, trust building, personal styles, uh, weak organizational performance. Retreats and games are even mentioned in here. Uh, a number of uh, case studies that have been done to try to really figure these things out. Okay, um, there's just there was just a summary page. Uh, it helps us predict things. Burns transactional theory. I thought I had a summary. Maybe I just wrote it up. <laughs> I thought I had a summary page that just quickly listed each of these. Okay. There's a nice illustrated graphic summary. Yeah. All right, well, so forming is when everybody's coming together that first time. And you may or may not know each other, but generally you don't know each other. So you're generally strangers the first time. Um, you're brought together because of your different skills and different approaches to take on some kind of problem. So whether it's an adventuring group or a project, an engineering thing, you're all being brought together. The, that's the forming stage where you get to kind of know each other. And everybody's usually on their best behavior. They're usually very polite and considerate. But everybody's very tentative. Nobody really wants to look bad. Nobody wants to step on anybody else's toes. And it's not a very productive time. Basically, very little gets done other than just getting to know each other a little bit. But really, you don't get to know each other. Uh, the Matrix, they say, you do not really know someone until you fight them, right? <laughs> Which is going all the way back to Sun Tzu and, and <laughs> uh, So, forming stage has to happen. It's not a very productive stage. You really don't get anything done. Nothing on the project or beating the bad guy or whatever really gets accomplished. And your team is whoop, 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 three stooges, stepping over each other. You're trying not to offend the others. So, you're really ineffective. Eventually, people start to get tired, like, come on, guys, we've got a deadline here. Or, come on, guys, the world is going to end if we don't stop the bad guy, whatever. So pressure starts to build, and somebody somewhere, or multiple people, start to say, enough of this shenanigans, we need to start getting things done. And temperatures might flare. And so you start to get into the storming phase, which is where now people are trying to, like, fine, I'll take leadership. No, I'm going to take leadership. No, you, what do you know? And now things are not so nice. Things can be, get kind of nasty depending upon the situation. And, and some argue that you must have the storming phase in order to go on to norming and, and performing. You cannot get to true performing without a full storming phase. There's other arguments about that. And by the way, there are a lot of other group dynamic theories that are much more nuanced and stronger in some of their theories than Tuckman's. But Tuckman's is really applicable to gaming and accessible for laypersons. So it's one of the reasons why I choose this over a lot of the other social theories that are out there that get really, you have to take a lot more time to break them down. This people start to get pretty quickly, um, especially in business of being so predominant. So uh, storming phase, now you're stepping on toes. Everybody's now like, I will do this. No, I will do that. And it chaos ensues. A lot of gaming groups never get past that storming phase. Right? Think about the groups that nobody ever really <coughs> normalized. So that's where you get to norming, where you go, okay, I'm going to wait here and have my fireball spell ready. You're going to get ready to kick in the door. 
You're going to have the net ready to throw over the bad guy. You're going to, you know, everybody's like, no, you're, you're having to verbally say it to get in norming. You say, okay, I'm going to do this, and you're, and it's communicating. And at norming, you're getting stuff done. You're, you're getting things accomplished, and you're being effective. You're not stepping all over each other's toes. You move beyond being too polite, and your group can accomplish. And groups that get to norming can be like that forever and have a great experience. Um, you often also have cycling, where you have times where you kind of fall back into storming or things like that. We're not even talking about when you bring in new people, because that starts to cycle all over. Mm -hmm. um, so often you will see people start norming for a little while and then fall back to storming. Like, and under one crucible of a situation, they'll get really good at, at the norming stage, they figure it out, and then they don't repeat it in other sessions. You're like, come on, guys, you had it. Last week you had it. Why, why did it fall apart this week? All sorts of reasons why. So there's kind of a rotation that goes on between storming, norming, storming, norming. Hopefully, eventually, one of the things I say, there needs to be a strong leader in a group. If you don't have a strong leader, it doesn't mean a dominant leader, but a strong leader, um, a competent leader that others respect. They don't have to dominate. They can totally be the step back type, but there needs to be somebody there that helps with getting people to that next phase. And everybody else starts to figure out where it becomes unspoken and unwritten. When you get to the performing stage, you don't need to say, hey, wait over there, you do this, I'll do this. It's automatic. You know, so uh, ATF teams train over and over and over and over. They don't have to say a word to each other. They've got the procedure down, and they go in. Military, all the time. Drill, 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 till you've, you it's automatic. Phase by saying, I'm in charge. You're doing that, you're doing that, you're doing that. <laughs> but, no but for special squadrons, for yeah. special units, they, they have to go through all that yeah. um, before they come effective. They, right? they, they wash out. If they don't get through that effect of trusting, storming and norming is building up trust. And if you get there, and it's a big if, but if you get to performing, now you're the chance for the entire group to have real flow state. When you're in storming phase, it's very difficult. In norming, you can have it. In storming, you'll have individuals getting flow state, but that's often at the cost of others. And really ticking off the others. Like, I had a great game. Yeah, you stepped all over us. You hogged the ball, basically, right? You know, I had a great basketball game. I scored 64 points. Yeah, you screwed the rest of us. Thanks. You know, yeah, we won. But, you know, what a jerk, right? Same thing with that. It can happen in storming for individuals. But as a group, you won't have the group experience, uh, at least until norming. And that's only going to be smatterings. You get to performing. That is when groups really stand out. That is when you see, you know, apples really extraordinary groups that push through in a certain crucible. You know, IBM's had them with their think tanks. You have these groups that just do these amazing, innovative things, come up with incredible solutions, and you come out of it comrades. You may never like each other outside of work, but you have a lot of respect, and there's a comradeship and, you know, being uh, brothers in arms and being in the trenches together that you feel there's a strong emotional connection that happens there. That's when you get to forming, and that's when you really have that great opportunity for flow state. Now the group ends, or you miss, finish the mission, or you, whatever. That's a journey. Bye, it was nice to know you. That's a whole process. Now these were added later, but there's a process of saying goodbye. It may just be five minutes later. Yeah, that was a great game. Never see you again. It was at a con, whatever. That almost never happens it, it, that you get this in a con, but you know. Um, and then there's reforming, where, oh, we've, we only come together once a year. Like Tolkien Moot, we do every year. We have Tolkien Moot 13 or 14. 13. <coughs> yeah, so we, we're coming on our 14th year, I think, of Tolkien Moot. And so some of us just game once a year for a day or two. And so that's kind of reforming each time. And there's new people coming. So every time you bring in new people, you got to go through this reforming stage. It's different than straight forming. When you're forming and everybody's new, that's different than when you have a group that's already there and you bring in a new person. Or you have a group that hasn't seen each other in a long time. There's been some changes. And it's a different process than straight forming. And that's why they added those two. But generally, the four are the main ones to, to focus on. So... As we, we will we will spend an entire session just on this, actually multiple sessions at some point, and you'll really start seeing this in your groups. Um, you, he watches for it uh, as a player type specialist uh, when watching games. Now, in public settings like that, it's hard for them to get very far. Most people don't get to know each other, but we've seen some. We've seen a few here and there, not the whole group, but pairs and such that, that have started to become more productive over time. Um, but it's hard to do in these public settings. And that's where cons and things don't give the same experience that you get when you do it in the comfort of your home and a regular group that is the same players all the time. When you're mixing up all the time, you keep going to reforming and reforming and reforming. And it's really hard to move on to the other stages.
So that's the advantage of the classic recreational style of you all are the same people playing together without having to entertain people, etc. Um, so we'll go into a lot. There's a lot more, but that gives you a little bit of a, a high level of a bunch of different theories. Um, some a little deeper than others. Any questions before we say goodbye for the night? Uh, let me start with Mark. Mark, you have any questions? Because it's late for him over there. It's after midnight. Uh, no, no about How did you feel about this first session for you? Do you see ways that you can use this to help enhance, even at this stage, your, your game mastering skills and experiences? Yeah. Yeah. When I'm done with you guys, you'll never look at role playing games the same way as you did before you came here. Um, and it'll help enhance it. I don't want to ruin it for you. So, music theory, and I, I have a music background. A lot of people who go into music professionally say they can't enjoy music anymore. My hope is this will enhance your experience, not take it away. The music theory people say they can't, these are performers, they can't enjoy their performance because everything has to be perfect and they always have to be on. And they're aware of every single mistake because they've gone through so much analysis and torn apart everything they do, they can't enjoy the music anymore. I'm like, that's a horrible thing because music is so beneficial. Pick up a different instrument and play it casually. Mm -hmm. Let yourself play slop. You have to break yourself of that rigidity because you've jazz. ruined the music for yourself. <laughs> um, and my middle son went through that. He was awesome at the cello, but he was so rigid he couldn't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. He enjoyed the overall experience, but he couldn't enjoy it. And we made him learn the guitar, and he's doing blues and jazz and loosening up. And then he became a better musician overall because of it. Mm -hmm. um, so my hope with this is it will not make you hyper aware and like, oh, I have to be on all the time. Instead, it will make you aware and be able to enjoy it that much more because you're going to have a broader understanding of the experience that you've been having intuitively all along. But now you're going to have some of the cognitive stuff mixed in to explain why this is happening, which then hopefully will help you make the experiences even better. Because when you don't know what's going on, you're like, I don't know why that group blew up. But if you go, oh, well, they were stuck in the storming phase, and this guy was a rules lawyer, and you were able to break it down to all these pieces, um, you can now take control of the situation and fix it before it becomes too much of a problem. Or if it's post-session, session, do we, we, a post-mortem or whatever of a, a failed group, which we've got to do that LARP again. Did I ever do that with you? No. We've talked about it several times. All right, there's a LARP I need to do with as many of you as I can get, which is a failed adventuring party but it's a LARP and it skips the actual adventure. It starts with everybody, the forming phase, you all get you know, your different characters randomly signed with a little bit of connection. There's a little bit of reality show stuff that goes on silliness between the characters. And then they go and disembark on the adventure. And then you skip the adventure part and everybody comes back after. And there was a fatality or multiple fatalities. And now you've all got to deal with why did those characters die who oh, did what? I not not real life. No, nobody. Oh, not, we don't kill <laughs> players. We kill characters. Um, if you listen to the Pax Unplugged panel, I kept <laughs> picking on people because they kept telling me, yeah, we've lost, we've, we've had entire, you know, uh, players that die in our groups and stuff. I'm like, really? Players? You mean characters? I hope. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> they were saying this. How many players? And they like, kept doing it. I like had to keep it correct. <laughs> this is where language matters. <laughs> TPK total party kill of characters, not players. So um, anyway, so then you have to role play through the post mortem of a failed dungeon adventure, and uh, it's kind of a fun thing, and it's a useful tool for assessing uh, a failed adventure that you GM'd or played in, and looking back on and going, okay, well, what can we learn from this? How can this become a learning thing? So most times I have to do that as a as a training mechanism. Right. All right. Well, we're a little over time. Next retreat. Yeah, we should, we should, we'll, in the summer we'll probably try to do another retreat or something. We'll see. It depends on our convention schedule. Uh, Danielle, Mark, any last? Uh, let me start with Danielle. Danielle, do you have any questions or comments before we say good night? This should be a part of your um, your intro list. What should? This is the best one where we go through almost all of our founding things. Just the high level review. Okay. It should be in our intro because it's a high-level review 
over all of our county. So you want like this specific video linked to in the new volunteer training checklist? Yes, for uh, anyone who's going for GM or okay, okay. Minimum. All right, keep reminding me, and I'll get that. I'll get that added and linked to it then. Uh, Mark, any last questions or comments before we call it a night? Excellent. What can we? What are we planning on you for your schedule? Is it just going to be th uh, Mondays or different days? What What are you thinking for your schedule? Uh, I'm gonna try and make the uh, like I, I'm hoping to make tomorrow's noon. The Tuesday nine to noon. Um, so that'd be noon to three for you. Uh, research meeting. Okay, great. A lot of that's going to be kind of research or administrative. Uh, we're going to go over each of their blog postings that they're preparing. One's on bleed, one's, I think, on gender. We've got different ones to go over. So that'll be, yeah, that'll be a good one for you to check out and meet some of the researchers. So that, that'll be great. Um, and then Thursday, we do the same thing, but this Thursday will be applied gaming. Um, I think if we don't even plan, I want to do the house building from Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire. Yeah, I don't have anything planned for this okay. Yeah, so that's Next probably. Car no, okay, yeah. good. So, so next Monday will be Doctor Who RPG. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Luke and Jay will be Carla. Yes, yeah. So next Monday will be Applied Gaming, Doctor Who Role Playing Game Part 2. Carla will be the GM. Uh, so you can jump in even if you're jumping in part way. Uh, learn a little bit more about the Doctor Who Role Playing Game. Um, <laughs> What's that? I hope to make Mondays my regular. Okay. Excellent. And then Saturday is when we have Game Master Specific Training. So, like, we did a workshops on voicing and workshop on rosters and things like that, and we have a lot of others to do. So, um, yeah, lots of choices there. And, then of course, Sunday you can just kick back and watch and enjoy Heroes of the Mist from 6 to 9. Um, and you can donate and participate, and you can affect the game because you gain hero points hanging out in the chat room. And then you can spend those hero points. If you go to mistheroes.com, you can see the catalog. And it causes weather, encounters, NPCs <laughs> to happen, to the, and it's almost real time. And if it's an NPC or something or an animal, I try to name the creature or person after your username if it fits in some way. So we had somebody who was Chibi Wolf, so they wanted some kind of dog, so we had a Chibi-type dog show up at the game. <laughs> Just a very rounded dog and such, but um, and we had fun with that. And then Dan, yeah, and then, then we had somebody threw in somebody who went by the handle Dark Monkey, and so we had a very dark furred monkey who's kind of been recurring things. They keep donating and making it show up and cause trouble. The further north they get, the more challenging it is to explain the monkey, but uh, everybody's loving that monkey, loving in quotes, but, but they're, they're enjoying it. Uh, it's it rifled through a bunch of their gear last time. Um, okay. Uh, um, Shane, any last comments? Call it a night. Um, just um, as we were talking to Alana, Seth, um, just having a lot of flashbacks and, you know, getting names to things that happened right. in my past experience. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the experience is good and obviously some of the experience yes. is Any experienced GM is going to go, yeah, 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 I get it. Mm -hmm. And now we've got language to describe it without having yeah. to give a whole story. We've got now shorthand yeah. to describe it much more quickly. Yeah, and a lot of the stuff that you guys have talked about before, I'm, 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 I'm absorbing a lot more now, so... I right. learned a lot yeah. tonight. It, it will great. build in layers. It'll keep. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. I'm so love. I'm so glad that's working out. Riley, uh, you've heard a lot of this before yeah, already. Like so it was a lot of review. Yeah. Glad it's still reviews better than. Yes. Review. Well, and I've got to formalize. Like, now you said it lost your. So RPG Education is an online learning platform. Um, it's courses. RPG Education for the actual classes. You said it lost your test scores. Yeah. I, I, I know I'm for a fact. I, it, I know for a fact that data was there, but I did do a database update, so I'll have to go back and check that. Because when I did the import for the old system, mm -hmm. I checked your specific grades, and it was all there. But I wonder if that last upgrade broke something. So I'll go check. Now, you're not one of the people who had two different logins, are you? I don't think so. All right, I'll double check all that. But I got your message about that, and I've got it on my to-do list too. Right. To delve into that because I need to get RPG education back up and running because that's where all of this that we're talking about you only get hit once mm. you get to go back there and read it and listen to my audio lectures and hit it as many times as you want as volunteers you get unlimited access um, for other people you got to pay and it's like six months or a year or whatever it's only like 25 bucks but 
um, it lets you iterate through, and you have to get 100% before you move to the next chapter, and the next chapter, and the next chapter. And it, and then it's the actual testing platform. So when it comes time to do your diploma tests, that's the platform you'll use. So eventually, but it, we've had tactical issues, so getting it back online. Um, John, any last comments before we call it a night? Nope. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you if you've been watching, listening, and, or if you're catching the recording later. If you're not yet a donor, please swing by patreon.com forward slash RPG research and become a Patreon supporter of our research and community efforts. We would really love to have you uh, uh, be part of our community. And um, there are all sorts of levels there. The higher up you go, up to about $25 a month, the earliest access, you can get content right away. So if you miss the live broadcast, you get the recordings, um, a higher quality local recording uploaded uh, fairly shortly after. And we are revamping the Patreon goals and rewards. So if you have suggestions for what you would like to see as a reward or goals that find you more motivating to donate higher as you check them out, let us know. Give us feedback. We're very open to feedback and trying to optimize the experience of everything. <laughs> Ready may be, be well, happy gaming, and namariye. Come here, Paul. Peace out.